Hey everybody, this is Chris from CSS Tricks with video screencast number 92, which is going to be a code walkthrough of my recently released drawing table. So let's take a look at what the drawing table is. Uh, it is this. It's kind of a little one-page application where you can kind of click these table cells and turn them colors. You can click and drag and kind of draw shapes and designs. You can pick different colors for those designs. You can erase parts of it, basically draw. And there's a bunch of different little features it has. You know, you can change the size of the grid. You can... Uh, 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 put tracing images behind it. You can get the HTML for it, that type of thing. Now, what's the purpose of this? This isn't, you know, this isn't the first of its kind, really. What, why, why create this thing at all? The idea behind it was a slide I saw from a friend of mine uh, doing a presentation about HTML email, and they showed this email uh, from the Style Campaign. It's basically a table and the cells inside of that table are colored to make a design like this. Now, it's a little bit more than just kind of a cool, neat idea. You know, for one thing, it's really lightweight. There's no images used here, so it's kind of a quick to load kind of email. But more importantly, uh, have you ever gotten, like I use Gmail, have you ever get emails, HTML emails from kind of an unknown source or, or uh, even known sources sometimes? It just doesn't show the images at all and there's this little yellow warning box at the top that says always display images from and then shows that thing and you have to click that in order to see the images now it's like that in Yahoo Mail and Gmail and probably a whole bunch of email clients it just doesn't show you the images right away for whoever knows why I don't know just maybe it saves bandwidth in some huge quantity or maybe it is there to protect you from bad images in some way I'm not sure what the deal is there but that's the case, and a lot of people just never click that. They don't realize they can click it or choose not to click it. This is a way that you can show someone something visual uh, without w w just like basically getting through that. There's not any images to reveal here, but yet it's showing you something imagey. So I, th I thought that was neat. I'm like, you know what? I'm going to copy that idea for CSS Tricks, but I'm going to just like make the CSS Tricks logo in it. And, uh, and you know, I mean, I'll show off this too, but I'm just saying, hey, this is a cool idea, isn't it? Check out my design. And I set out to make the design. I was going to make this star. And I was like, you know what? This is so hard that I think it would be easier, even in creating one design, to make like a tool with JavaScript to do it uh, than it would be to just even create one design. So I set about creating that tool and then I just ended up kind of adding a bunch of little features to it and thought that it would make, you know, an interesting tool to put out there as well as a couple of interesting tutorials. So uh, actually, if I just go to CSS Tricks here and go to the home page, well, when I released this in this article called Drawing Table, I actually I showed off the tool and you can download it and you know get the link to the demo that we're working with but it also has a bunch of written explanation a bunch of written code so if you want to follow along with that and have little bits of copy and pasteable code go ahead to css-tricks.com slash drawing table and there's kind of a written tutorial that goes with it I know in these screencasts that's not always the case so in this case that is the case and you can uh, read more about this but I am going to be walking us through the creation of this. Uh, and that's, that's the deal, folks. Big table. It's going to do stuff. Now, I want to take a look at some of the HTML so that we know what we're going to be working with. I want to look at these features here so you know what functionality, what there is to expect, and then kind of go through each of the features and how they were built. We're focusing mostly on JavaScript because, honestly, that's the interesting part here. There's not much to this design. It's more about how each of these little features work. It kind of makes for an interesting little JavaScript tutorial. So. That's where we're at. Let's look at Coda. I have uh, opened up a few files here. I'm logged into the live CSS Tricks server. These are the files that power this little demo here. 
Now there's, you know, typical file structure. There's a CSS folder, images folder, JavaScript folder, index file. Now that's the HTML that powers this. It's HTML5, even though we're not really using anything specifically HTML5. It loads out, it loads in a couple of CSS files, loads some JavaScript files, and then gets right to it. Now here's the title, and then there's this div called controls. And each of the features of this thing are basically a field set with a legend that says what feature it is, and then any HTML that kind of needs to power that feature. Then that gets closed out, and then there's just the table itself here, uh, which ends up being on the left-hand side in the table or in the design itself. Here's the table, and inside of it, there's just a single table row and an empty table cell. Those are just in there, so it kind of validates, but it doesn't really matter. Clearly, this table that we're looking at here is has a lot more cells than that. You know, when this page loads, there are a table here, but there's a lot more than one table row and one table cell. It's really 20 by 20. Lots of different table cells in here. So that's one of the first things that the JavaScript needs to do is build this table. Now, I on purpose put that stuff in the JavaScript because, uh, because I knew that I wanted it to be changeable. And it's not only just these three sizes, but we could make any size and, and whatever. I just wanted to have there be a JavaScript way to build this HTML markup, to build this table itself. So that's one of the first things that gets tackled here in the JavaScript. Notice this table has an ID of drawing table. That's kind of the meat of a lot of this is we're going to be using this table right here to attach a lot of our functionality to. Now, if we go into the JavaScript file, it says drawing table.js. This is a 100% you know, written by me. This is our code that we're going to be working with. This isn't some existing library or anything. Uh, just because there's a lot of code, this is a, a code walkthrough. You know, we might be writing a little bit of code, but for the most part, we're going to be looking at some of this existing code. First thing in drawing table.js is a function. It's called build grid, you know? It's nice to name your functions exactly what they do. It takes two parameters, columns, and rows. The first thing that it does is create a variable called table markup, which is an empty string. Then it loops through, now the number of rows there are, so we're passing in a value of 20. I happen to know that because later on, when our code actually executes here, we have set up a couple of variables, one of them called columns, one of them called rows. Each of them have a value of 20, and then we call the build grid function with those values. So this is going to run 20 times. 20. In, in this code in here runs 20 times. It makes an opening table row tag, and then this code in here runs 20 times as well. And it makes table cells with a non-breaking space in there just because a lot of browsers like to have at least a space in their table cells. Uh, so we put that in there instead of nothing. So that runs 20 times. Essentially, it, this you know makes uh, 400 table cells because of this kind of loop within a loop. And it makes this really long string that's HTML. Then it takes that really long string of HTML, uses the HTML function, and says the drawing table, that table with an ID of drawing table, uh, make the HTML of it that really long string of HTML that we just built. So take anything that's inside of it, basically get rid of it and replace it with that, with that, what we just made. That's what the HTML function does. So that's building the grid. And it's really, really fast. Even though this has to run like 400 times or whatever in here, uh, it still happens really, really fast. And it turns that string into actual DOM elements and does it on screen like almost instantaneously. So as I reload the page here, you can't even tell it happens. It's just so fast. It's just as soon as the table or the, the page is loaded, the table is there. It's really, really fast. I was concerned a little bit though, like is this the best possible way to write this code? So uh, that's what a, uh, the forest community is really good at. So I posted this code and I said, hey, this is how I'm creating basically an empty table. Uh, is that the fastest way to do it? And there was an interesting comment thread. So if you're interested in if that is the best way to create a table like that, uh, check this out. A bunch of people had some really kind of interesting ideas about, about different ways to do this. 
Uh, they all kind of have their own strengths and weaknesses. You see this guy's like making an array and, and, and squishing the array together. Um, some people are cloning. Some other people uh, are actually like creating elements with native JavaScript. Turns out the way I was doing it is pretty darn fast. So I didn't go ahead and change it, although there's some ways that were just slightly faster. There's definitely some ways that you could do it slower. Anyway, if you're interested in this kind of loop HTML creation kind of stuff, check out this thread. I will link to it in the show notes for sure. So that's the build grid function. Now we're we starting to get into this. This is code that executes as soon as the page is ready to go here. So the, one of the first things we do is build the grid, and then we start binding events and stuff, making some of these features work. One of those things is changing that grid size. There's a drop down select, you know, a select in HTML is a, is a drop down menu. That's what's going on here. When this changes, it changes the grid. So you don't have to click a button or anything. It's just anytime you select something, it changes the grid size. So that's just a few lines of code here in our JavaScript. It watches for an element with an ID of grid size. Now that's right here. It's one of our field sets, the grid size section. Here's that select. It has an ID of grid size. It has three options in it. You, these are what you see the options, and this is the value that we have access to of those options. So when it changes, which is just this change function, that's a, something that jQuery gives us access to. It just says, you know, when, when this element changes, the value of it changes, then run this code. And we're saying, you know, we're just caching this because we're going to use it more than once. And it says, go get the value and then split it where there's a comma, which makes an array of every, you know, every where there's a comma, it splits it. And then zero is the first thing in that array. And one is the second thing in that array. So what I'm trying to do here is access uh, the 10 separately from this 10. So if I change these values around, it's just a way that I can get two unique values out of one kind of string here. So I'm trying to figure out what those, what the rows are and the columns are. And then as soon as I have those, I just build the grid again. So whenever that changes, it builds a fresh grid with those two values. And you've seen that work a number of times now, so you understand it. Now, clearing the design works in a very, very similar way. An item, an element with an ID of clear, which that's just this button here, with an ID of clear, when you click that, Go look at that drop-down menu, figure out what its value is, get the rows and columns in the same way, then build the grid again. So if we go look at that and we draw a little design, when I click clear the design, it looks like it just disappears, like it just writes over these things with white or whatever. But what's really happening is it's rebuilding the entire grid. And it can just do that so fast that you might as well do it that way. It's no big deal, you know? Now, it's important that it, it keeps the same grid size. So when you click at it, it goes and looks at this value here, sees that I'm currently using a 10 by 10 grid and builds a 10 by 10 grid. So if I'm on 30 by 30 and I have a design, if I click clear the design, it stays 30 by 30. So that's that little function. Now let's look at, I guess we should talk about the actual drawing itself. How does drawing work on this thing? Now at first I was like, I'm just going to make it, you know, when I was first just like, I just need a quick tool to draw my little star that I want to draw. I was just like, I'm going to bind click events to each of these table cells. And if you click it, it changes the color. That's all I was going to do. Uh, and then I was like, you know, it's really cumbersome. It takes a long time to draw something when you have to individually click each cell. It's much more natural to be able to click and drag and make a line. It's just a lot faster and it just feels better. So we're going to need to deal with that clicking and dragging. Now, there's not a really a drag event, unfortunately, in JavaScript. We kind of need to deal with that ourselves. So how we're going to deal with that is when you click... It, when you do in a mouse down event, we're going to keep track of that. So we're going to have a variable that deals with the state, and it's going to be called mouse down state. And then as soon as you click up or release the mount button, that mouse down state is going to turn off. So that's basically the gist of it. Now, so we have mouse down and mouse up, so that's dealing with the clicking. But we're also going to have an event that's whenever your mouse enters a new cell, 
that fires a, a, a mouse enter event on that cell. Now it's gonna, on those mouse enters, it's gonna check and see if the mouse down state is down. And if it is, basically do a click on it, but not really do a click on it, just color that cell. So every time your mouse enters a new table cell, it checks if that mouse down state is down. If it is, draw on it, and if it's not, uh, don't draw on it. <laughs> so I can click, and because my mouse button is down, it's drawing, and as soon as my mouse button comes up, it doesn't draw anymore. So that's up to us to keep track of. So let's take a look at kind of how that works. Um, this is a very interesting and really perfect use of jQuery's delegate function. Delegate means uh, attach an event uh, to all these TD elements that are within the drawing table. Uh, but the interesting thing is that the event is getting bound to the table itself, not the individual table cells. This is a very important concept to understand because those table cells get like ripped out and rebuilt all the time. If you clear the design, those the ta existing table cells, if they had events bound to them, got ripped out and replaced with new table cells, we would need to rebind those like that mouse enter and mouse down. All those events would need to get rebound all those new table cells. And that's just not very efficient. With delegate, we don't have to worry about binding events to each one of those table cells. We just bind an event to the table itself and say, you know, when you get a click on you, check if it was within one of these table cells and then uh, f fire off that code. So we can rebuild, rip out the HTML, put in new HTML all we want, and it doesn't matter. We don't have to rebind events because we're using delegate. It's a very smart thing that jQuery offers that really all libraries should have because it's awesome. So when you do a mouse down event within a table cell, fire this code. First thing I want you to do, turn the mouse down state to true. We initially made it false when we declared that, value, declared that variable. Make it true. Uh, cache the this selector. Now if the erase state is on, and we haven't talked about erase state yet, so don't worry about it. If that's on, then basically erase. Otherwise, color the cell. This is the drawing part. Now that's just the mouse down. That's the first, when your mouse goes click, that's the mouse down, but not click up, just down. That's it. Now, also using delegate, the mouse enter, now this is the click and drag functionality. As soon as your mouse enters any cell, check if that mouse down state is true. So it's saying if mouse down state. That's just shorthand basically for saying if mouse down state is true. Then do this stuff. I'll cache the this selector. If you're in erase mode, erase. Basically do the same drawing stuff as we did above. We want to basically behave the exact same way, only we need to check if the mouse is down or not. So that's it, that's, that's, the, that's the gist of it. Now the drawing action is just setting the CSS to the current color. The current color at the moment happened to be being red and clearly we'll get to that being able to change color very soon. Now there's one more interesting little bit about this and, and that's when do we turn that click state off? You know, when the mouse button comes back up, we need to turn the click state off. Now, we didn't bind it to the table itself, the same place that we bound the, the mouse down function to. And that's because of this. Let's come out here and look at this. Let me clear it out. If I click and drag and then unclick within the table itself, I'll stop drawing. But if I can click and drag and come outside of the table and unclick, we still want to turn drawing mode off. When my mouse comes back in here, I don't want to still be drawing. No matter what, no matter where I unclick, I want drawing mode to be off. But I only want the unclick to be able to happen within the drawing table. So in order to deal with that, uh, we bind it to a different event. I bound it to the HTML element itself, basically anywhere in the entire browser window. If you unclick, or use the mouse up event, then all I want you to do is turn the mouse state off. So somehow kind of magically, uh, even if I make the browser window smaller here, click and drag off of the entire browser window, it still kind of throws me a bone here and it turns the drawing mode off, which is kind of awesome. I'm not even sure how that works exactly. 
So anyway, that's drawing. Very easy, very cool. Now we need to deal with erasing. There's a couple of different ways that erasing happens. One of them is you just click the white circle and it's basically like you're drawing with white here. You've just chosen a different color. Now to facilitate this being quicker, like uh, let's say I'm drawing and I wanna draw like a perfect cross here, but oh, I, I, I screwed up like that. Now, I could mouse all the way back over here, click this, and fix that or something. Uh, but that's kind of a pain to have to mouse around all the time to select it. I said this little option. Hold the Option key for temporary erase mode. So I'm drawing around. I'm trying to get my perfect cross, but I screw up. I can just hold the Option key really quick. And all I did was press a button here, and you can see how it temporarily highlights that white circle over there and deal with erasing. So you've already seen the code that handles this, basically it's if erase mode is true, uh, then remove any of the styling. So anytime you're drawing, if erase mode is on, then I want you to remove the styling from that particular table cell. So all we need to do is keep track of that erase state, which is just another true, false, Boolean variable. It starts out being false, so there's a couple of different ways to turn it on. One of them is pressing that option key. So in our document, we can watch for uh, presses on the keyboard. A lot of the times we'll uh, bind uh, key up and key down events to like, uh, like inputs and text areas and stuff like that. You don't have to, you can watch for key downs and key ups anywhere on the entire site itself. So that's why we're attaching this key down event to the document itself and we're watching for a, a particular key being pressed and that has a key code of 18. That's the option key, which we've noted right here. So if you press the option key, or you, your key goes down, just like mouse down, just the down part, fire this code. If it's the option key, then turn the erase state on. Now just for a little bit of visual feedback, there's these three lines here which remove the selected class and apply it to the circle. It also sets the previous class here so that when the key button comes back up, if it's the option key coming back up, then kind of reset that. Go back to the previously selected color and turn the erase mode off. So not very much code here, that's just turning on erase mode, which we've already built into our drawing functionality. Now there's another way to turn erase mode on, and that's actually just to click on uh, the, the, the color swatch that is the eraser. So that happens, and we might as well build that functionality into the color picker itself. So if we go back into the web, this is the color picker. Three different swatches plus an erase mode. So if you click that, we need to watch for that click. So that's what's going on in this color picker section. We're using the same de delegate function itself in the color selector. If you click on anything with a class of color, run this code. So each of those swatches, including the little erase swatch, have a class of color. If you click on any of those, do this. And it's going to do this thing called pulled value. It's going to pull out from that swatch an attribute of data color. Now let's look at the index.php file and look at each one of those little swatches. Each of them has an attribute of data color. Now you can have data anything in HTML5. I could have data whatever and just store stuff in there. It just doesn't matter. It can be data, dash, and then whatever you want there. It's just a way to avoid, a lot of people in the past used to use rel to store data. That's not really what it's for. It's just a, the HTML5 kind of realized people were doing that and gave us kind of a valid way to do that. Uh, and just I'm just exploiting it a little bit for that. Now notice the eraser, the white one has a data color of eraser. So when we pull in that value, which this is where that, that data color attribute is getting pulled in, if that value is eraser, then I want it to turn on the erase state. And if it's not, I want to turn the current color, which is just a way for us to keep track of what's the current color we want to be drawing with, uh, to that value, and turn the erase state off and then just indicate visually which, which swatch is selected by removing and adding that class. And that class, all it does is say border is black. 
So as you, as you click on these different ones, it just removes the class and adds it to the one you just clicked on to give you a little visual feedback that that's the selected thing. And of course it changes that color so that you're drawing with green now. That's just how it is. It's saving state. That's what kind of makes this an application is that this application can be in certain states. We're keeping track of a bunch of states. Okay, so that's that functionality. That's drawing and erasing and all that stuff. There's a few other little bits of functionality that it has. One of them is tracing mode. And this is, um, it was kind of to make it a more generally useful tool. I was like, I could just try to draw a star by just kind of looking at it, but wouldn't it be nice if I could just plop an image underneath of this and kind of just trace it? So that's the idea with tracing image. And I put, uh, a box here where you can type in the URL location to an image and it will place it there. But just for an example, I ha already have a value in there. You can just click place image and it will show you. I put an image of a Blinky here, I guess one of the one of the other characters from Pac-Man bad guys and you can uh, trace it. So let me put this on 2020 here and I can just grab blue and you know draw the eyes and I can grab red and and start drawing this out. Now, I can kind of see what I'm doing. Oops, I made a mistake there. I can just hold option to fix it. Uh, because it's there's a little bit of transparency going on, so I can see how I'm doing. But I wanted to be able to toggle this on and on on and off so you could track your progress a little better. So that's what this that that place where you input where you drop the URL goes away and it just gets replaced by this button where you can just turn on and off that image and kind of check on your progress. So that's kind of a neat little feature. Let's look at that real quick. When you click it, so uh, or <laughs> that input where you type in that URL is part of a form. So when a form has a submit button, uh, if you click on that submit button, it fires a submit form event on the form itself. Likewise, just being in that input and pressing the return key also submits a form. So this using the submit function here covers both of those possibilities, which is the reason to use submit here instead of something like a click event. Anyway, uh, this is the, the input of the actual where you would type that URL and just grab the value out of it. So I'm just getting the, putting that in a variable that we can use. Now this is jQuery element creation syntax. Just make a new div. That new div, I want you to have a background image of that URL that we just pulled. I want it to be this particular size and height and opacity, and I want it to, to place it absolutely at the top left corner and give it an ID, and then just append it to the table wrap, which it isn't the table itself, it's just a div that goes around that table. And then I want to take the table itself and pull it down in opacity and then deal with turning on that button. So that's all that's going on here. As soon as you click that button, it goes out and, and places a new div on the page over the table, actually under the table. It's kind of magical. It uses Z index to do that so you can still draw on the table. It puts this div underneath of the table. Uh, uh, and, and that's it. And then you can, you can toggle that mode on and off. So that's what this toggle tracing mode is, is it has a bunch of stuff to do. It has to, you know, turn the, the visibility of the image on or off. It needs to change the name of that button to say on or off. It needs to toggle the opacity of the table to lower or to full value. And it needs to turn tracing mode as a state on or off. So it knows what to happen next time you click on that button. So that's what's going on there. Just a few more things to cover here. Uh, one of the things about drawing that we kind of skipped over is that you're not just limited to red, green, and blue. There's these little multicolored buttons beneath that and you can click that to open a color picker, literally, and change that color. So if I want orange instead of red here, I can make orange, hit select, and now I'm drawing with orange. I can clear out so you can see it a little better. Ooh, I should make clear the design, get rid of tracing mode. I should have done that, but you can just reload the page. Now I'll, I'll pick orange. 
and now I can draw with orange. Now the way that works is actually a third party plugin called the Color Picker. I just, you can see me, my Google search term up here, jQuery Color Picker, comes to this page. I think it's pretty well done. I know some people have some gripes with this plugin, but I think it works pretty well. You can just hit download, download those files, and kind of be off and running with it. It comes with some images you'll need to throw in your images folder. It comes with some CSS that you'll need, and then you link up. That's what this colorpicker.css file is and this colorpicker.javascript file. As with all plugins, please load the plugin file after you load jQuery itself so that it works. So what that gives us access to is a new function called color picker. So we can now call that, and I'm calling it on these inputs. Now, each one of these color swatches I have in the HTML here has this random like input in there and it looks kind of weird, but that's just where I've decided to keep track of that color. So with CSS, I actually styled each of those inputs to be those little color wheels that you can see here. Each of these little guys is actually a text input. Now when you click on it, it fires up the color picker. That's the deal with this color picker uh, event that that plugin has given us. And the important one with that event is on submit. So when you've picked a color and you click the little select button to select that color, run this code. And what it does is it says, you know, make sure that that's the selected color now because, you know, you just picked that color. It's probable that you want to be drawing with it right away. Uh, make sure that the CSS of that swatch changes to the new color so you can see that your swatch is now that new color. You know, make it selected and uh, change the, the data of it to the new color. So if you switch to green and then switch back to your new color, your new color is still active. And this little bit here says uh, when you open that color picker that it should st be at the color that you chose. So if I'm at orange now and I open this back up, it's going to be that orange color. It just kind of makes sense. It's just kind of good UI. Now the last thing here is get HTML. Now that I've drawn a design, let's say, you know, I got this new design cooking and it's this big green monster thing like this and it has like a blue thing around it, the worst design ever, and I want to use this in an HTML email, it's just one click. I say, get HTML of current design. It, it fills this text area with all this stuff. I can literally copy it. I can go out to somewhere like JS bin and just paste it in there. Get rid of this JavaScript. I don't need to run that. I'll make the width of it like 500 pixels or so instead of 100%. Just hit preview, and there's my design. Just proof that that HTML is the exact design I created. I could drop that into an HTML email and be ready to go with my new cheesy design there. So that's kind of the point of this whole thing is that last step in getting the HTML of the design, and that's so super duper easy to do. Uh, there's the get HTML button. So when you click in the HTML, this little button with an ID of get HTML button, get HTML of current design, then I want to fill this text area with that HTML. It's one line. It just says I want the value of that text area to be equal to, and I give it a table with a style of 100% with collapsed borders. And then, and then within that, just get the HTML of the drawing table. When you use this HTML function that, that um, with no parameters that you pass it, it's called a getter in jQuery, and it will just get that HTML and just kind of poop it out here within this table. Then I close the table, and that gives me the string that I need, and I just drop it into that text area, and that's the HTML. So I got my perfect design, hit this button, select all, and I'm done. So that's the... the <laughs> It's kind of nice that the last thing we need to do, the final most important part about using our design is one of the easiest things we had to do here. So that is the drawing table. Hopefully it's kind of useful either as a tool to you or as a, as a learning experience for learning jQuery and how to write simple applications like this. Like I said, there's a written tutorial which you can follow as well here. And you can download the complete working version of all this from that article. So if you just want this code to play with, understand better, look at, manipulate, just grab it from there. You can do anything with you you want with it. I don't care. So thanks, folks. That was Screencast 92. Until next time.
I will see you later. Bye.